Hello, Michael Stack here, principal of AMAX, founder of Comp Club, and co-author of your ultimate guide to mastering workers' comp costs. I recently attended the Workers' Compensation Summit, which was the start of the national conversation hosted by Bob Wilson from WorkersCompensation.com and Judge David Langham, who's the chief deputy judge at the Florida Office of Judges of Compensation Claims. This summit was attended by 39 individuals representing various stakeholders because there's been questions about the adequacy and fairness of the current workers' compensation system as well as the future of our industry. So these stakeholders came together, including employees who are injured workers, employers, carriers, TPAs, injured workers' attorneys, defense attorneys, medical providers, and state regulators. These individuals came together to talk about important issues, about where we are today and where we're going as an industry. And as we left that summit, after those two days, one of our main goals was to take the information that we discussed and share it with the industry. Because no national conversation is complete without your input, without your perspective. So I've put together this series to be able to get you up to speed quickly and be able to join the conversation right where we left off. So in this first session, I'll be reviewing the pre-summit documents, which were submitted by the 39 individuals that were in attendance. And all told, there were 21 documents submitted, which contained hundreds of pages of materials to be designed as a base of knowledge prior to that discussion. What I'll be doing is I'll be reviewing and giving you a highlights and cliff notes edition from my review of that material and my notes. In the second session, then, I'll be diving into those discussions that were held over those two days in Dallas. I'll be talking about the perspectives of the various stakeholders and the different issues that were identified, as well as the imperative issues and friction points that we identified over those two-day lengthy discussions. In the third session, then, I'll be talking about the regulatory points as well as the incentives that we identified that exist that may be causing some challenges. Finally, we'll wrap up that session with how this conversation continues. So without further ado, let's get into the pre-summit documents. Okay, so the first report that I wanna walk you through is the report from the National Commission of State Workmen's Compensation Laws. And this was completed and submitted in July of 1972. And the first thing that I want you to note in this poor report is who this was written by. So John Burton was the chairman of this commission. And we'll talk about sort of what was involved in this study and why I think it's important for us to understand this history as we're reflecting on our current state laws today. So John Burton is a name that you're going to want to recognize. It's going to come up a few times throughout the course of our discussion here. John was the chair of this commission, of which was a 15-member commission. And give you some context here on what this commission did and really the goal of it. And I want to take you now to my notes here and go over some of my notes and the things that I really took out of this report. So first opening paragraph, which I think to reference here is important to get this context, is they state, opening up this report, they state that in recent years, serious questions have been raised concerning the fairness and adequacy of present workmen's compensation laws in the light of the growth of the economy, the changing nature of the labor force, increases in medical knowledge, changes in hazards associated with various types of employment, new technology creating new risks to health and safety, and increases in the general level of wages and cost of living. Obviously very applicable to the conversation that is happening today. So while there obviously have been significant changes since when this report was written in 1972, a lot of dynamics in politics, in policy, in changes in state laws, the general nature of the state of the workers' compensation industry at the time of the writing of this report is very similar, I believe, to the state of our industry today. So this commission was crafted. It was 15 commission members. This started during President Nixon's era. It started in June 15, 1971. They had one year in order to do a comprehensive analysis of the state workers' compensation systems. These 15 members had 11 meetings over the course of that one year. They concerned 32 days, on average 17 commissioners that were in attendance. They also held nine public hearings for a total of 18 days. A lot of time invested in the research 
of this particular report on the workers' compensation industry. They also had a full-time staff of 30 employees that assisted those commissioners, and they reviewed more than 200 documents that were provided to the commissioners by the staff. So significant investment of time in the analysis of the state workers' compensation laws. And I want to review with you what their findings were. Again, obviously very significantly different today than it was in 1972, but a lot of parallels as far as where the state of the industry was at the time. The commission had really five main objectives of what they found in a modern workers' compensation system. And as we opened the Workers' Compensation Summit in Dallas, we discussed these five points and agreed that they are still all very relevant in today's system. The first was the broad coverage of employees of work-related injuries and diseases. Second, substantial protection from interruption of in income a provision of sufficient medical care and rehabilitation services, encouragement of safety, and finally, an effective system for delivery of the benefits and services. I've attached this document with my notes that highlight some of these different points. And as you can walk through, and as we walk through this on the screen here, you can see the different recommendations that were given by the commission. And there were really 32 recommendations in this summary report that they gave. A couple of things that I want to highlight, and they noted here the essential elements of workers' compensation recommendations by this commission, and we'll walk through those now. And here they are here, and as you, if you want to go back and take a look through this document, I've noted those numbers on there so you can get further detail on what was included in these recommendations. But they recommended compulsory coverage. They recommended no occupational or numerical exemptions from coverage. They recommended full coverage for work-related diseases, which is still a very relevant topic, I think, today. Uh, full medical and physical rehabilitation services without arbitrary limits. Again, another very relevant topic today. Employees' choice of jurisdiction for filing interstate claims. As our economy has grown and there's more companies that are national and larger in scope, another very relevant topic. And then finally, adequate weekly cash benefits for temporary total, permanent total, and death cases, as well as no arbitrary limits on duration or sum of benefits. I want to talk about a few points in their conclusion here, just to give you some scope on to what their conclusions were and how they really projected the future. And you can see here in this part three, the future of workers' compensation, which is obviously where we are today. They stated here that, and they concluded that state workmen's case compensation laws in general are neither adequate nor equitable. This was their conclusion in 1972. They go on to say that there, we conclude that workers' compensation are permanently delayed, disabled. Is there a basis for now continuing this program? They went on to discuss that we have discussed those implications of getting rid of the entire system, and they defined that that was still inferior to the workers' compensation system as it stated. A couple of the challenges that they stated here, which I think are very relevant today too, they talk about the lack of interest or understanding of workers' compensation by the legislators and really the general public as a whole. That was one of the issues that we addressed, which we'll I'll talk about in the following video. But I think a very relevant challenge um, in our industry today and even when the officials do want to try to make reforms, they don't really have enough information. And there's this irrational fear resulting in this competition of states that the employers are going to move their state because of the costs. I think that's a very significant issue to note and, and one that is, again, very relevant today. They rejected that the federal administration be submitted for the state programs. And one of the things that they recommended was to have the federal government help the states learn from each other as far as what's working in one state and sharing that information. So that's the summary of the 1972 report. I want to take you now to the next following issue, which is this issue of where we are today and why we're having this meeting and why the 1972 report was originally written which is the t deterioration of workers' compensation laws. And this question today is workers' compensation a fair and adequate solution? So a couple of documents that suggest there is interest in changing that and there's interest at a federal level to now go back to what that discussion was in the 1972 report. So this was a letter uh, dated October 20th, 2015. This was written by 10 members of Congress, um, including Barry Sanders, Bernie Sanders, which is one of the obviously presidential candidates, which people are very familiar with uh, that name. But this statement goes on to now reference 
the 1972 report in this letter to the Department of Labor. They talk about the 1972 report, how it was issued by President Nixon, goes over that information as we just discussed it. They gave 19 essential recommendations. It states that federal, those federal standards as recommended by that commission were never actually enacted, but the Department of Labor annually reported on that state's compliance with those standards up until 2004. They state a, a fact here that since 2003, legislators in 33 states have enacted changes to workers' compensation laws that either reduce those benefits or make it more difficult for workers to qualify for those benefits. And today, only seven states follow at least 15 of the, 19, uh, 15 of the commission's 19 recommendations, and four states comply with less than half of them. They use this language called the race to the bottom, which now appears to be bottomless when they're talking about the opt-out laws, which the next document I want to take you to, which references that same sentiment, that same type of language and that same type of idea is called the Status of Workers' Compensation in the United States. It's a special report written by the Workers' Injury Law and Advocacy Group, known as WILIG. And I'm going to take you through this report. It was written in November of 2015, right around that same time. Talks about the history of the grand bargain, but then goes into that sentiment of the great chipping away and really going into that deterioration of those state laws, how those 33 states have enacted laws since 2003 that have reduced those state benefits. It follows them and uses that same language of the race to the bottom, really just reinforcing that idea that there's a, a growing movement of questioning this fairness and adequacy of the workers' compensation industry. And then they go on to talk about opt-outs, how that is a threat and the negative impacts that can come from that program. I want to continue along with these um, documents and I want to reference Fast forward now to 2015. As I mentioned, John Burton was a name that you're going to want to know that was the commissioner of that 1972 report. And I want to take to his conclusions and statements. We're going to get back to this idea of SSDI in the next segment here. But I want to take to his conclusions and his statements in regards to reflecting on that 1972 report and how it's relevant today. So this was his solution, saying that the SSDI program is now cost-shifting to workers' compensation is the context for this report that he wrote. And he again references the 1972 report and those recommendations that they gave, of again, which he was the commissioner back in 1972 and the author of this particular report that we're writing here. He goes on to reemphasize that idea of the competition between the states and how there's that race to the bottom, again, reemphasizing that movement of the questioning of ad adequacy of the current workers' compensation system. Now, I want to take to his conclusions in regards to those federal standards that they gave in 1972 and why they are not applicable today. So he writes, Burton identified several problems with the proposal to enact those federal standards for state workers' compensation programs in the 21st century would make this an unrealistic approach to help solve the current difficulties of SSDI. He goes on to now state that in the post-90 developments in workers' compensation laws, there have been resulted arguably in cost shifting to SSDI. That was really the point of this program. I'm sorry, the point of this paper largely involved changes in compensability, which we just referenced there throughout in that 1972 report as their recommendations. But the rules in regards to such requirements such as the major contributing cause of workers' disability must be work-related. So he talks about how that's been a significant change from when they wrote that in 1972 to now where things stand today. And this idea of major contributing cause was one of the elements that we talked about in the summit held in Dallas, which I'll get into further in the next video. But the idea of major contributing cause is essentially a 1% aggravation of an existing injury, now that employer is responsible for the whole injury versus the idea that it has to be a major contributing cause or 51% contributing cause to that injury for the employer to now deem that compensable. That's one of those laws that have been enacted that were referenced in that paper by the congressman as well as that Willig paper that are now reducing those benefits or perceived to be reducing those benefits for the injured workers. John now then goes on to state in this particular paper, as a result of these problems, further discussion of federal standards as a partial solution is unwarranted. 
despite the considerable virtue of this approach. So the political climate, the lot of changes in where we are today as a world and as, an, a, as a country make those recommendations and those federal standards per John's view really an impossible and unwarranted discussion to continue to have in his mind. So the next idea to take you to now is the idea of this cost shifting from workers' compensation to Social Security disability insurance. And there's a couple of papers that I want to walk you through and documents to walk you through to give you some of those different perspectives and identification of this issue because it's a significant one in this national conversation and the idea or threat or potential involvement of the federal government in the state workers' compensation systems. So this document here is the NCCI Annual Issues document from 2015. And I wanna highlight this little paragraph here on Social Security Disability Insurance. In this first paragraph, they talk about the dramatic increase in the number of beneficiaries in the SSDI program, as well as the fact that the trust fund is projected to become insolvent in 2016. Obviously a significant issue for the federal government and a potentially motivating driving force to become involved in the workers' compensation system, particularly if there is a significant cost shifting from the workers' compensation system to SSDI. So that's what that first paragraph really references. Then they follow up to say the SSDI debate could be used by detractors from the state-based system to push for an expanded role in federal role in workers' compensation. So now let's talk about that and, and talk about if that actually is true. And I want to show you why this conversation is really happening. And again, this goes back to John Burton's article. This was a paper that he wrote. Um, this was in 2015 regards improving the interaction between SSDI and workers' compensation programs. And I want to show you why this conversation is happening primarily. You can see it really very clearly on this graph here. You can see the negative correlation between SSDI, which is in the green, and you can see those costs really escalating every year, while at the same time, the cost of workers' compensation is decreasing. So you, when you look at this from a national level, very plainly in this graph, you could see that negative correlation and very easy to say, well, workers' comp costs are coming down and SSDI costs are going up. So obviously there's a cost shifting that's occurring there. Let's talk about two different papers now that speak to this point. This paper was written by John Burton and is a proponent for that cost shifting and a statement that there is cost shifting that is occurring and offers he offers a number of different solutions in order to help prevent that. So one of those is reversing, discontinuing the reverse offset. Um, he gives four recommendations here, improving the design and implementation of the offset. He talks about experience rating the SSDI program, a number of different things that aren't necessarily relevant to this workers' compensation conversation, but the idea of cost shifting certainly is relevant. Now I wanna take you to this paper, which is the effect of state workers' compensation program changes on the use of federal social security disability insurance. And this was a study that was done specifically on this idea of is there cost shifting that is occurring from the workers' compensation to the SSDI program? It was a specific study, study done by the National Bureau of Economic Research in April of 2010. And I want to take you to their conclusion here and show you a couple of the uh, different things that they found. So here is a significant point. It's, they state that we find the negative correlation between measures of DI and workers' compensation receipt, which appear at the aggregate national statistics. So that was the graph that we just looked at. You can see that negative correlation between those two lines. They say that it's not held up at the state level, casting doubt on whether that causal link actually exists. So when you look at those figures in the aggregate at the national level, there's a very clear difference, but they're stating throughout the course of their studies that that, that doesn't hold up at the state level. So determining, is that actually true? Is there a causal relationship between those two? Here's what they found, is they found that although it's possible that a causal relationship between the two, two programs exist, they argued that the decline in the workers' compensation outcomes is not a significant factor in the increase in disability outcomes during that same period. So throughout the course of this paper, this is a 52-page paper, they give backup and data onto how to they, they came to that conclusion. But their analysis throughout the course of their analysis and this study was that they did not find a significant correlation between those two programs. 
However, even though that they made that conclusion, you can note that this paper was written in April of 2010. And there are significant references and confusion in this conversation, which was noted in that NCCI annual issues report, talking about this cost shifting idea of SSDI. And again, that's probably due to the fact that the trust fund is becoming insolvent now in 2016. So the government is now looking for ways and looking for solutions. And this could be one of those ways that they're looking at, which is one of the main drivers of this conversation. And you go back to this point here, which was the congressman letter that we talked about from October of 2015. They go on to speak about the race to the bottom, but on the second page, now they talk about SSDI and how that's a contributing factor and that cost shifting between SSDI and workers' compensation and how that is a contributing cause to the insolvency of that SSDI trust fund. Issue there, and then one more example of this, which we'll talk about this letter in another minute, is was a letter from NIOSH, as a letter to NIOSH, pardon me, from ACOM, which was the American College of Environmental Occupational and Environmental Medicine, Catherine Mueller and Gary Franklin from the Washington Department of Labor, where they also are referencing this SSDI cost shifting idea. So a very common um, idea. It's a very big part of this conversation and a good thing to understand of some of these cost drivers that are in fact in place. So now we want to take you to the final set of documents, which really now start to talk about the solutions and some evidence-based medicine and research that has been completed in order to potentially solve some of these problems that we've identified. The first document that I want to take you to is the ACOM guideline, preventing needless work disability by helping people stay employed. I was very impressed by this document. It's the best piece of research that I have seen from the medical perspective that will drive positive outcomes and integrate solutions into the system. So I want to give you some examples and pull out a few points for you to note. This report basically states that this report focuses on the large number of people that due to medical conditions that should normally result in only a few days off of work end up withdrawing completely from the workforce and either end up permanently disabled or disabled for long periods of time. And this speaks to the idea, going back to this letter um, to NIOSH and to the CDC, that 5% of injured workers are associated with 80% of cost and lost time in workers' compensation systems. 5% of injured workers are associated with 80% of cost and lost time in workers' compensation systems. It is generally agreed that the workers' compensation system works for most people. Where these questions of fairness and adequacy come, come in the smaller percentage of cases, but obviously the smaller percentage of cases are a big piece of some of the challenges and frustrations that are occurring, which is why we need to start to address these solutions throughout the course of this conversation. This particular paper written by ACOM speaks directly to that challenge. And now how do you take that small number of people that starts as a small or pretty standard run-of-the-mill type injury now turns into a significant injury having a very negative impact on that individual's life as well as being very costly for that employer or for that payer. So this report goes into great detail on the stay at work and return to work process. We know from a number of studies how valuable that return to work process is in controlling workers' compensation costs. And I want to point out a couple of points here to pull out of this paper, I would encourage you to read this in detail um, as a significant amount of strong information in regards to solutions from the medical perspective. So they note while it's been overlooked because of the incorrect assumption that if the medical condition is promptly and properly treated, the worker will naturally return to work. And that is an assumption I believe that we carry through our industry. We look at the medical needs, you say you have a broken arm, your arm is fixed, now you should be back to work. And this paper goes beyond that and looking really more at those whole at the whole person and some of those other drivers that may be causing that 5% of those injuries that are causing the 80% of those costs. It goes on to say that only a fraction of the medically excused days off of work are medically necessary, meaning that most people should be getting back to work very quickly. And that's that metric or that benchmark that we incurred that's 90 to 95% of workers should be back to work within zero to four days. And that's what an organization should be shooting for in a strong return to work program. 
I want to highlight this point here is acknowledging and dealing with normal human reactions. And I think this will help to start to understand some of that scope is that patients now take on this sick role or the dependent patient role. And after becoming ill or injured, you now have that right or that freedom to receive care and be free of fault. And I think anyone that's been sick and laying on the couch dealing with their spouse can relate to that particular point. And I think it's a good one for us to now understand as we start to dissect and understand some of these solutions and how we can now integrate them into our conversation. A couple of more points here to pull out from this paper. Reduce the distortion of medical treatment process by the hidden financial agendas. So this is in disability cases. Medical treatment is often distorted with patients seeking the particular diagnosis or treatments to obtain or maximize benefits. So this goes back to the, uh, that idea of that sick role. When you're uh, an injured worker and your idea is now, how do I maximize my settlement versus how do I get back to work? And that's that shift in mindset, which is a very real uh, effect within an individual and a very real effect within a, a human being in order for us to now consider and how do we now work towards a solution considering some of these obstacles. A couple more points here. Pay the physician for disability prevention work to increase their professional uh, commitment. Sitting again from the physician perspective, which I'll talk about in the following video when I talk about those perspectives, is when physicians don't consider disability pre prevention as part of their job. And in the workers' compensation space, there's many responsibilities that physicians are asked that are typically not in their training or a part of their job description. So understanding that perspective um, and a few more points here that although physicians play an important role in that stay at work, return to work process, they're typically given very little information from the employer. They're very rarely getting job descriptions. They're very rarely interacting with the employer in order to get that person back to work in a timely fashion. This report was completed by Dr. Jennifer Christian. She was also in attendance at the Workers' Compensation Summit in Dallas. So offered a lot of valuable information in regards to this particular paper. Which leads me to my final point that is now we understand what these solutions are, but there's a big difference between understanding a solution and having something that you can regulate. We know that communication works. We know that getting employees back to work works to control costs, works to improve outcomes. We know that developing those relationships with medical providers, providing them the information as it was just referenced and, and getting that employee back to work, those best practices work and they have been proven both from an employer standpoint and from a medical standpoint. What I want to highlight as the last point here in this uh, particular se segment is that in none of this information, when we were talking about regulation, we were talking about SSDI, we we're talking about the race to the bottom, very rarely, if ever, do these laws now start to talk about that person. It's very difficult to regulate solutions. It's very difficult to regulate emotion, behavior, incentives. The only piece that I found that references something to that degree was this one piece in the 1972 report that's talking about the proportion of lost wages. And they're talking about how much should be included, whether it's two thirds or 80%. But it talks about balancing those incentives between employers to improve safety within the incentives of the disabled to take full advantage of those rehabilitation services and return to work. It's the only piece that I found when you're talking about regulation that now speaks to this ACOM letter. It speaks to those best practices in regards to return to work, in regards to motivation, and in regards to incentives. So the last point now to consider is the only law that takes into account these best practices for solution, the only law that I'm aware of anyway, and that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I want to take you to some of these key points of the ADA because because it's starting to now regulate human behavior. And this states that at the time of injury, referral to HR and a discussion referred to as the interactive process regarding a reasonable accommodation must occur. And employers are required to provide a reasonable accommodation to any employee or applicant with a disability unless doing so would cause an undue hardship. So the three main takeaways and the three key pieces to understand in regards to the ADA are the interactive process, which simply means a discussion and a conversation with that individual employee. You're interacting with that individual, talking about their disability and talking about what accommodations could occur to allow them to continue to do their job unless those would cause an undue hardship. There is a significant amount of gray area within the ADA laws 
but this law is very optimistic in what it is regulating, which is human behavior, regulating that interactive process, regulating that there has to be some communication with that person, and regulating that the discussion can lead to potentially making an accommodation for that individual that would allow them to continue their job. It's a piece of legislation to be aware of as we can continue our national discussion in workers' compensation. So I've covered a lot of information throughout this session in those documents. I want to thank you for your participation and sticking with it, as well as your interest in this national discussion. Your participation, your thoughts are vital to the continuation of this national conversation in workers' compensation. As I said in my next video, I'll be talking about some of those perspectives from the employees and employers and carriers and attorneys and regulators, etc., that we really revealed throughout the course of those two days and those in-depth, lengthy discussions that we had in Dallas. Also, I'll be di divulging those imperative issues that we identified as well as those friction points we identified in the system. So thanks again for your participation. And remember, your success in workers' compensation is defined by your integrity. So be great.